Welcome, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Ann Hensley, and I'm the Vice President of Media Operations here at Freight Waves, and we're happy to present today's presentation in partnership with Next Trucking. Today, we're going to be exploring data and drayage, specifically how data can provide real-time insights into the drayage process to help overcome inefficiencies and drive greater visibility and maximize profitability. We're going to be hearing insights from Next Trucking's co-founder and CEO, Lydia Yan, as well as Chief Revenue Officer, Bobby Nap Napoltonia, and FreightWave's drayage market expert, Henry Byers. We'll also have a live audience Q&A with the speakers following the presentation. Before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, if you have any questions for our team during the webinar, please reach out via the chat function in your Zoom control panel. Also, if you have questions that you would like to ask our presenters, you can enter those through the Q&A box in your control panel and we'll answer as many of those as we have time for during the live audience Q&A following the speaker presentations. At this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Bobby. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you've chose to join us from. I'm super excited to be here today. Never before have I seen an opportunity where data can make a difference in an industry that's ripe for change. And what I say by that is if you look across the industries that we all live through, we've seen it through electricity, we've seen it through communications, we've seen it through cloud computing. Just about everything that we do in our day is, con is, is added through an experience that is heightened through data. And so today what we're gonna talk about is an industry that we're all familiar with that without the equivalent of data, which is an enrichment of an experience, it will be horrible. Freight today has gone through transformation. Specifically, because we're located in LA, we like to compare it to Hollywood. And it started with black and white films. And over time, that was the first form of an experience called entertainment that was on television. We then moved to, or theater. We then moved to sound, which added a whole new dimension and an experience. And it was the data really transformed into sound that allowed that packet to be delivered and actually enhance the experience. But as we continue, what we saw was that color came. And we all probably remember watching The Wizard of Oz, the first thing that came on color Sunday nights. Ultimately, it moved to animation. And we see this occurring in our industry where freight tech is advancing across the entire supply chain. But we see this outpacing us. IMAX has come, CGI has come. Here's an industry built just for us to have fun, and yet the advances are far greater than industry that allows us to sustain and survive our lives, not just from consuming the goods that are shipped into our country, but the jobs that it provides for the people that are associated with logistics. Then we got into 3D and virtual reality, which is a whole new world. And this is really where technology and data come into play to allow an experience that we believe should transcend into logistics, freight tech, and most importantly, drayage, into virtual reality. But this isn't just for Hollywood. What we're seeing are these industry trends around telephony. Look at the phone that you probably made a phone call calling your mother or tracking your child today. Imagine if Alexander Graham Bell were around, it would not look like it. He would pick it up and he would say, what is this? but it moved from the telegraph to operators, to rotary phones, to Skype, to the iPhone, and all the apps that exist in the marketplace that make our lives heaven. We then saw it in transportation. We first started crawling, walking, then we had a wheel, a boat, a Model T, and today a Tesla. And we can see that it's happened in banking. First bank was in 2000 BC. Then we had the Medici Bank in Italy, and then we had Diners Club. Ally Finance, and today even folks like Zillow can provide banking on the spot when you see a home that on your phone that you like while you're standing in front of it. And the data that powers the ability for you to purchase that home is what makes us a powerful experience for all involved. And now we're seeing it in freight tech. It too started with a wheel, then it went to horse and buggy, and then it went to technology. And that technology was powered by IBM and an AS400, and it got stuck. Imagine if we were stuck with black and white film with just sound. How would our life and day be like? Well, today, we know that's like everything that happens in drayage. So freight is built like on a diner's club card. It's good, but it's not great. And we believe that it's time for a makeover. And that makeup starts, makeover starts with you and the industry accepting what we're terming the new norm. And this new norm has transcended across every industry 
and now it's time for freight and logistics to take it. So we believe and we know that drayage is one of the most opaque, inefficient segments in the American trucking industry, dominated by small, undercapitalized carriers using yesterday's technology. Well, the intent is great. The technology that they've been given is almost an immediate failure from the start. And that's why we have things that are called pain points. And we know what those pain points are because we hear about them every day. And if you're on this webinar, you probably feel them every day. And our goal for you is painless freight. And we know that we're capable of delivering it because today we ship everything from Apple to Amazon to Walmart to Wayfair and all that letters of the alphabet in between. And the pain points range from the mega ships that are stressing the existing port infrastructure, mandatory appointment settings so that we don't have congestion, the chassis catastrophe specifically here in LA, which is one of the worst debacles in transportation history. And then of course the ELD mandate, which is aggregating national truckers, creating a shortage, but is well intended to make it safe for the American people to be on the road, knowing that drivers are really being contained in how much they do. So why does data matter? Data matters for a lot of reasons, but before we get there, we should talk about the pain points continue to go on. And just this week, I was on a tour of the Oakland port and I learned about a new pain point. And what I understand is that every day a pain point's uncovered that people suffer and just have no way of surfacing it. And these today range from dispatch errors all the way to what I learned, which is birthing time a ship stays out of port. And for every hour over, how it cascades and that that domino effect is terrible for all involved. And so why does data matter? It's for a common good. Collecting and sharing data on Drage shows us how to maximize the efficiencies for all players. And what we really believe and know is we need a data consortium just like you get for your financial scores that allow you to purchase a house and standing in front of it for an application you never filled out except for when you find what you want. So we believe with data sharing and actually making a system available through technology that will have no missed appointments, no waiting in line, faster turns which will equal more revenue and reduce charges, less stress on port infrastructure, increased driver safety and capacity and end-to-end -end visibility and greater shipper confidence. What this really means and our goal here at Next as a driver-centric marketplace is that every trucker has the opportunity to earn a wage and a living that will allow them to not just survive, but thrive. And by doing so, you're gonna see some unique things we'll be rolling out this quarter that make us the only driver-centric company that cares truckers first. And when we do that, we're, we're, we're hearing, and we heard this yesterday from the largest and actually number one in the world, if you make your drivers happy, you can have my freight all day long because I know it'll be delivered on time. It'll, they'll treat them like their children. My cans will survive and they will arrive. So an international port drage move involves multiple stakeholders, the ports, the steamship lines, customs, truckers, container owners, chassis owners, shippers. I could go on and on. CHP, the local police, are you actually backing up the highway? What's happening? And it's all been on the same page to get the products successfully picked up and delivered. Because of these multiple stakeholders, there's a lack of transparency and very, very little automation, which creates inherent waste in the supply chain and ultimately an inefficient system. By the numbers, port contribution to the US GDP is about 26%. That's quite significant or $5.4 trillion. The drage market by size is greater than $50 billion. There's more than 50 million shipping containers coming into America, 15 million hours wasted in the port for appointments, and some folks that actually sit in their truck waiting three or four hours are turned to go home, hoping they'll find another way to feed their family because the port just couldn't take the truck in and allow them to earn a living. And that's where Next is applying its technology to partner with the ports, the terminals, the steamship lines, the BCOs, and you if you're on this call to make it a better life for all involved. And now we're gonna open it up for a little quick Q&A before we jump to the next section. Awesome, thank you so much, Bobby. That was wonderful insight on your end. And Lydia, at this point, I would really love to loop you uh, into the conversation. What are some of the biggest inefficiencies or frustrations that you see within the drayage industry? Absolutely, so let's take a look at the trucking industry overall, right? It's an $800 billion industry and extremely fragmented. 
90% of trucking companies, small ones with less than six trucks, less than 10 people. And the top 50 trucking companies only account for 16% of market share. The industry is backward, there's lack of technology, driver allowing traditional brokers to find them loads via phone calls or text messages. And the trucker shortage is our number one problem. And 97% turnover rate to driver leaves the job for two reasons. One is low pay and second is horse dispatching. So coming back to the drainage, which is one of the segments in the trucking industry, and it would present $50 billion yearly avenue, but it is probably the most complex segment. We call it the first mile because uh, port drainage is hauling the container from the port to a local warehouse. It's really the first mile journey of every single imported good. But it's extremely complicated, as Bobby just mentioned, that you know, it involves multiple players from steamship lines, terminals, chassis providers, shippers, carriers. Everybody's working silo. And uh, it's so complex because it takes our product, very smart product engineering team, for two weeks just to understand all the jargons that we have in the industry, right? Chassis, demerge, per DN, street turns. So it is very hard for people from outside of the industry to learn the industry while all the players in the whole ecosystem are working silo. There's really lack of data sharing. And the, let, let's make LA and Long Beach port an example. We have two ports, we have 13 terminals and everyone's using different appointment system. Everyone is using different operating system and nobody wants to share the data. Everybody wanted to hold the data to themselves because they worry that information will be used against them. So it is actually a norm right now in our industry. And uh, because of this lack of transparency, there's really very little collaborations among all the players in this ecosystem. And that caused the delays at the terminals. Last year, the delay at the terminals cost over $350 million. So there are a lot of problems that we need to solve. And of course, comparing with truckload, Dredge has 17 touch points. So that's the thing that we're working on right now at Next Trucking is really to develop the softwares and solutions to solve all the problems and create a streamlined experience for shippers and allow drivers to make more money. That's awesome. Thank you, Lydia. And Henry, I'd love to loop you in as well from kind of an industry perspective. What would you add to that? I think Lydia has done a great job identifying a lot of the key points there, uh, specifically for the trade in industry. But I think, you know, a lot of these, this frustration stem for, from not having a lot of the data, you know, upstream and downstream, kind of on both sides of the equation as well. Um, so it's really having visibility into, you know, vessels, where are they on the water, what's affecting, you know, their rotations, their services, what's happening in the countries uh, of origin, you know, for U.S. imports, is there any volatility in those ports, what's happening there? All this data coming together, you know, along with the data points that, that Lydia has identified, I think are, is going to be key uh, to, you know, relieving a lot of these frustrations. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Henry. And back to you, Bobby, we talk a lot about the need for greater visibility. What kind of data is available today that can provide that visibility throughout the process? That's a great question. So the data today that's provided comes through a system that was, um, probably from 1980s, some of the people on the phone wouldn't be here, called EDI. And this is a very, very fragile connection type, which is electronic data information integration that allows you to actually share it. And today, most of the phones or applications there are through modern APIs that allow you to do it. So the data that we want to start sharing ranges from what is in the container? When did it leave? Where is it going? Is it ready for pickup? Is my appointment ready? Is there congestion? And if you start weaving back the 17 touch points, each one probably has no less than 10 data points. All that could never be calculated by humans unless you had a 10,000 of them in a room looking at all of them. And then you most certainly would have um, incorrect data entries. And so as we look at, uh, at the data, what we want to be able to control or contribute in controlling is for the BCO, the person that really owns the freight, and wants to know when it's going to be on the shelves so that any one of us can consume it is where is it at any time? And it's interesting because I know what's in my bank account now. I know my daughter's at school. I actually know where I parked my car, but yet I have no clue where I just spent tens of millions of dollars to create a product that I sent to a factory in a different country to be shipped to me to get unloaded and touched so it could get to a consumer. 
And that's kind of criminal. Hmm. Great. And Henry, what would you add to that in terms of the kind of data that's available that people may not be taking advantage of? Yeah, I can definitely speak to, to how we're solving that solution uh, currently. What I'm working on with Sonar, our, our data platform, and it's, it's, it's the information surrounding the, the vessel tracking to better identify, you know, the ETA, the vessels, what are the vessel wait times, like Bobby had mentioned earlier, um, and then, you know, how, how those vessels are affected in transit, uh, whether it be weather, um, you know, any kind of geopolitical labor, you know, issues um, on ports, at the ports on either side, um, and, and then, you know, on the ground, we're looking at, you know, terminal uh, data, you know, truck turn times, chassis management systems, you know, wh where are the chassis, where are they available, um, and, and then showing who they're uh, connected to, so you can better, you know, identify which assets go with which carriers and which services align with which alliances, um, you know, it's pretty pretty complex. So we're trying to bring, you know, visibility to, to each part of that. Great. Thank you. And Bobby, who do you feel like are the key stakeholders that Data Insights need to be working with? And what should that process look like? Great question. So I think that the key stakeholders, and it, it's both fortunate and unfortunate, when, when you talk about the data, we kind of see our, our position in the industry is really to democratize data. As a trucker-centric company, we want to make sure that every trucker has the same opportunity to receive real-time data as the largest BCOs in the world that have the ability to spend anything to get at that data. So when I think about who can consume the data, it ranges from the people that are going to be delivering the loads to the people that purchase the product. But where it really, really, really is painful is the poor person sitting in the customer service department at the logistics where you have 14,000 stores running a July 4th promotion looking for 14 cans that are going to put the product on the shelves where they've already had the ads committed that are going out into the circulars across the nation and on ads and on their Facebook pages only to not have the product ready and on the shelves. So just imagine how you would feel if you showed up at a store or you worked at it or you were a shareholder or you worked there and you had no clue where the products that you were waiting for the customers to come in your store to purchase would be. It would be horrible. And at next, our goal is to take it and make it painless freight, showing visibility from end to end so that you can get it on the shelf and we as consumers can go have a happy life. Yeah. Henry, what would you add to that? I would completely, you know, agree with Bobby. Um, I think for Dreyage, you know, it's all about knowing, um, you know, when and where a container becomes available and then, you know, probably, properly coordinating uh, the delivery to the, to the end user, uh, ultimately the BCO, the shipper. Um, you know, for, for imports, you know, vessel tracking systems and things like that, you know, having a near uh, real-time update, you know, uh, like I say, all the incoming vessels, things like that, um, you know, that, that data needs to be with, with all the providers downstream, but also uh, with the shippers and, and just, you know, bringing that together in one central platform, I mean, the world, because, you know, sharing that information is critical to making sure, you know, it's more efficient. Great. And back to you, Lydia, how have you seen data and technology used to make meaningful decisions that really impact a company's bottom line? Well, sure. Um, let's look at the, um, the industry overall. So everybody is talking about last mile. Everybody's talking about mid mile. And there are a lot of technology that are being viewed for these two segments, but um, drainage is probably the most neglected part of the company supply chain. But we always wanted to emphasize the importance of the first mile because it's really the first domino and it, if it doesn't fall correctly, it's going to impact the entire supply chain and 40% of merchandise is imported and we don't do the first mile correctly, it means 40% of our shelves will be empty. So neglecting the first mile can have very significant consequences, especially for a company's bottom line. Right now, if you're looking at the port, like 20 to 40 percent of trucks are making dual transactions. So we have a huge waste of resources. And it is said that uh, every year there's over $15 million wasted hours at port, and that equals to $1.2 billion total waste of truckers' time. Imagine we can wipe that out. So from our perspective, we started with, you know, how we can make appointment more intelligently, how we can better plan the trips and for the drivers, how we can better manage their time, increase the turns and the port, increase the number of dual transactions, and a better match drivers' trip with their preferences, and also with empty returns. 
and how we can help terminals reduce congestions and how we can manage chassis to avoid unnecessary trips. So there are a lot of projects that we're working on to really utilizing data to help terminal decongest and make drivers' lives better. Thank you, Lydia. And Henry, anything you would add to that? You know, I, I think, you know, certainly, um, you know, I've seen companies, you know, definitely increase the efficiency around their drainage moves, you know, by leaps and bounds, adopting, you know, the proper technologies because it un helps them understand the process, it un helps them understand, you know, and be able to keep, you know, track of, of key performance uh, indicators and metrics uh, surrounding, you know, the, the drainage process. And if you understand the data and it's clear and it's, you know, in a way that can be easily interpreted, it enables you to, you know, have the, the largest impact, um, you know, by, by knowing where to go first. So, um, you know, by having a clear picture of what's going on and, and how each, you know, segment of the drainage process is performing in your operation, you know, and it, it enables you to really hone in on where can we improve. Most certainly, if I could add there, those are all the front end forward looking, I'm looking out of my windshield. And what I've, in my fourth month now in this industry, recognize is that we suffer from iceberg pricing costs, where what you see is not necessarily what's ahead of you and what's below the line. And I really assess that and say it's really around the equivalent of blockbuster late fees. And if you think of the efficiencies that put a company out of business that ties back to the video that we show where Netflix came and all of a sudden changed an entire industry because we as consumers were all tired of paying late fees. That's no different than demerge, detention, SSORLs, and I could go down this crazy list of things where you get piecemealed on pricing. And if you had the data to more accurately manage your business, you wouldn't have things. Like most of us probably went to a library and had to pay a late fee for a book, which was 10 or 20 cents. And we're talking about the tens and twenties and million dollars. And the BCOs that I meet with this year that will be honest and say, last year I spent $4 million in blockbuster late fees and I didn't even like the movies I watched. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Bobby, if I could get you to continue a bit, what are some initial steps that companies can take as they work to achieve greater visibility and efficiency? I have a very simple answer. You can send me an email at Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y at nexttrucking.com and we'll solve your problems. <laughs> great. Henry? Well, you could really, Ooh. no, that's a great question, but that is also the real answer to be, to, to be truthful, is that we sit down with all of the stakeholders and are trying to truly better understand the technologies that we're building. And it's interesting because I think a lot of times I open up with, we come in peace. And I try to equate it to something we consume all day long, which is electricity and, uh, and energy. And, and I worked for a company where we were able to ensure that you never had to build a nuclear power plant in your backyard because we could take the data from the smart meters and turn your pool pumps off for one hour, not affecting anyone's life. And it can save enough energy that you would not have to build more power plants. And that's pretty powerful. And we believe that data will have the same type of impact here. And so by, by, by reaching out to us, and truthfully, we, we are uh, launching a customer advisory board. We meet with our truckers on a regular basis. Uh, we have a great new office here in El Segundo where we have open houses for everybody to come in and see that the new norm doesn't just start with us talking, but us showing and us sharing. And it was interesting. I was reading an article today about how automation and, and uh, technology is going to unfortunately uh, kill the, the ports. And I, I, I uh, say to myself, imagine if that would have happened to Silicon Valley, if automation, then, then that would not be the most fertile ground in the world where some of the best technology, or if you look at parts of China where they say, we're gonna start by looking at the pain points achieved. And so I believe we will create more jobs, more safe jobs and better opportunities for people in freight to move into the freight tech space. Great. Henry? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think the number one thing a company can do um, is first look at your providers. Are your providers, you know, capable of processing, you know, the proper data and getting the actual insights out of their data that are going to allow you to, to make your overall, you know, operation more efficient? Um, you know, if, if a company can't, you know, query their database properly and, and give you, you know, key metrics around, you know, what your costs are, you know, what it's been on a lane, you know, and, and have those, you know, what are, whether it's quarterly business reviews or whatever, um, you know, the ability to do that and, and interpret that data. And then secondly, to, to be able to transmit that to your system um, and make that process smooth, whether it's APIs or, you know, the, the old industry that uh, the, the, this industry seems to be using EDI. 
uh, but, but neither here nor there, you know, exchanging that information um, and that, that enables you to kind of, um, as you're, you know, scaling your own system, um, at least you know your providers have that capability. It'll allow you to make that transition much more easy or much easier. Great. And then one more for you, Henry. How do information sharing and collaboration around data affect the relationships between stakeholders? I think it really helps to build, you know, higher levels of trust um, between the stakeholders involved in the drainage process with, you know, with a greater level of transparency in, in, in each individual piece of the drainage process, you know, stakeholders can, can analyze, you know, the historical data and utilize those insights, um, you know, they gain to maintain, you know, the key performance indicators and then benchmark um, how each of those stakeholders are performing, you know, in their uh, particular task within that process. Um, you know, through sharing of, of that type of critical information, you know, stakeholders can agree and, and define how each part of that process should be managed and who's responsible for each process. You know, that chain of accountability is critical because uh, it really enables those stakeholders to identify what went wrong when an error occurs and not have a, you know, a he said, she said type of situation where, um, you know, it, it's hard to interpret, um, you know, where that, that process failed. Um, so uh, that's what I would say. Great. And Bobby, Lydia, anything that you would add to that before we move on to the audience Q&A? Yeah, I think beyond trust, there's a little bit that falls into it where uh, I believe it's our, we call it our three T's here at Next, which it starts with trust. And we think the cans are like kids. And therefore, when we uh, look at them, we should treat them with the same type of respect and, and like it is a child. The second is teamwork. We know that things will go wrong. We do live in and operate in the most exceptionally based industry I've seen around the world. And then last is uh, transparency. We have to be honest with each other if we want to solve the problems. And a lot of this opaqueness, and that's, you know, that's an opaque word within itself, mm -hmm. is because no one wants to be transparent. And here's the sad, sad, sad part. We know what containers come into what ports because the government makes you say what's coming through where. So it's not as if the data is so secret and so why keep it a secret of how you get it to where it needs to go and what are the problems and issues you're encountering along its journey? Yeah, great. Well, thank all three of you so much for sharing your perspectives with me. At this point, we would love to get those of you in the audience involved. So if you haven't already, go ahead and click that Q&A button and submit your questions for our speakers. We have several, so we will go ahead and dive on in. Um, this one directed at Next. Um, if you could just talk about what role you think the other data consortiums like the one between Marisk and IPM uh, play with what Next is doing in Drayage. How do you see them working together? Great question. They're, um, they're definitely on our list to reach out to because you just said two companies that are dominant players that have been around for probably about 100 years each and truly have uh, great stakes to claim in doing this. And we wanna work with them just like any of the other providers to ensure that we have open transparency of data and information that we can roll out. And so uh, we are a come one, come all as it relates to data sharing uh, from, from that perspective. And then we also have perspectives of if you build great televisions or you build great uh, microwaves or refrigerators, you probably shouldn't be in the data business. Or if you build great uh, spreadsheets, you should not be in, in the logistics business. And so we believe there's a time and a place for everyone. And that's why we at Next are maniacally focused about truckers first. And then that makes the BCOs happy. And we're going to create a new norm, which is data sharing and openness for all. And by doing that, we know we'll win. Great. And next question. It looks like this one's coming from a Dre service provider. Um, it says, how do you engage with carriers and what are carriers needing or expecting from Dre services providers? That's a wonderful question. And whoever did that, I would love to speak with you. And I, and I don't just mean that. We're, uh, we're growing our partner ecosystem, which will range from IOOs and if any of you haven't seen, I'd encourage you to go look at Kevin Luke and you can watch his video on our site. And this is a gentleman that uh, by embracing us has actually had his life changed and went from living in a truck to now being an IOO of three, uh, three trucks and growing his family, his life and his career up to the partner carriers that are wondering who are these big monsters that are going to come in and disrupt and put me out of my business. And so for the partner carriers, we'd like to say to them, listen, 
if we can tell you how or work with you, not tell, uh, how and where to pick the can up, you could probably have 10 to 15% of your operating costs go away because we're investing in technologies that will allow you to wake up and on a Saturday, see that your one truck, two trucks, 20 trucks, 50 trucks can have a whole week's worth of work and that every trucker, if they want, can make $5,000 a week. And my goal is I have 100,000 truckers in America doing that so that we can change the lives of the people that deliver everything around us today. Great. And we've got someone asking for kind of a real world example here. Um, do you guys at Next have any examples of maybe some business cases um, in terms of how you use gathered data to help improve a process for one of your partners? Most certainly, and that's a great question because one of the follow-ups for the webinar for all the attendees is we're going to be publishing a one-page white paper on how data can help you, and everyone will be receiving a copy of that within a week. Awesome. Thank that you. way they don't have to say, I don't remember what I heard. They're going to get to read what we are doing. Great. And Henry, I would direct this one to you first. Um, it says, I'm trying to figure out the detrimental impact of ELD regulations as it aims to improve hours of service for truck drivers. And we're hoping to have a trucker centric industry. Can you shed some light? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, a bit of a, a two part question probably, you know, one, one's the truckload piece, um, you know, referring to, you know, van truckload, uh, long haul, um, you know, type of situations, you know, drage is interesting because a, a lot of these moves happen within, you know, 150 miles and, you know, that they're not held to the same uh, requirements. Uh, for the ELD, but, you know, I think when you're looking at long haul, certainly has it impacted, you know, service of hours, you know, uh, you know how many hours you can operate and how fast you can make deliveries, I, I think certainly, but at the same time, you know, I think it, it is responsible to, you know, have something in place where you don't have drivers out, um, you know, on the road here in Chattanooga, there was a really horrific ac accident and it was uh, before the ELDs and uh, it was a, as a result of, the driver not having enough sleep and, and running over hours. So I think it's it certainly, you know, it, it may be de detrimental in some regard in, in terms of, you know, it, it may play into how you um, go about, you know, operating your business on the drainage side because you, you may only make moves within 150 miles versus, you know, over 150 miles. But, um, you know, I think overall it, it was meant to be a good thing and it, it certainly helps with the telematics data and processing truck times and turn times and things like that, which really helps us bring visibility to the overall process and deliver that data, you know, through, through things like sonar to those terminal operators and say, hey, this is, this is what's curr currently happening on the ground. This is what we're seeing in the data. And this is what we're seeing outside of your facility um, in that same data. Great. Thank you. And for next here, Bobby and Lydia, it says ports and terminals with air quality improvement goals are increasingly trying to upgrade the drainage fleets that serve them through cost sharing for truck replacement and or mandating more recent engine models. Can Next gather and share any info on the trucks using the system to enable drivers to take advantage of financial support for upgrading their trucks or expedite approval for entry at locations where old trucks are banned? All right, there's a lot of pieces in that question, so maybe we can unpackage it into different areas. Is that uh, fair? Yeah, sounds great. All right, so first and foremost, yes, the ports are putting mandates and each port has a different mandate and it's really around the Clean Air Bill Act. And uh, what we're seeing is different ports are actually instituting semi-different systems, but all along the same goal. And so we, we here at Next are, are all about having a clean port. And what we found is that a lot of the drivers won't be able to actually purchase new vehicles. That won't allow them to get into the port, which means they have no need for a TWIC card. And so we recently invested into a piece of property close to the port, and we have a product uh, that we offer called Relay. And this allows Next, who has invested significantly in uh, call it about 100 trucks, to allow us to go ahead and drain the swamp, the port, pull the, pat, pull the cans off site so that any driver that may not have a clean truck that's port accessible can still earn a living by picking up loads that don't require them to have the vehicle that's being mandated. So we're, we're really investing in making sure that they continue having their life. And as government standards may ease up, we're always looking for ways that we can help the IOOs grow their business. And, and my personal hope is that it follows the trends of the technology industry. And much like 
companies like Microsoft or Salesforce.com or Oracle or SAP have ecosystems of partners that have been able to grow and thrive and create industries and families that have great lives spills over into this industry where unfortunately it appears we're treating truckers unfairly today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Henry, for you, um, it says, do you foresee ocean containers ever having GPS tracking to help with tracking and tracing of our shipments? I'd say absolutely. I think it's one of the biggest issues that faces um, the ocean container industry. You currently, you know, from a shipper's perspective, it, they're really needing to understand where their containers are and sure you can track, you know, the vessel where the con container ultimately is, um, you know, at any given time currently. But I think being able to see it once it gets off the vessel, you just lose so much visibility into your container when it moves off that ship and into the terminal and then where it is in the process from, you know, being in the terminal um, to the end user, because I, I heard recently, you know, it's not so much about the asset, uh, you know, that, that's carrying it so much as it is the load. So you may see more of the loads, um, meaning like the pallets or something in an IoT device on the pallet or within, you know, the packaging that will be able to tell, you know, about the load at any given time and not maybe specifically the container. But I think from an asset management point of view in the steamship lines, I think it's going to be critical that they're able to identify where these containers are available because, you know, things like street turns, and I don't know if you're familiar, but, you know, when you go to deliver a container, um, you know, that, that normally returns empty back to the port, but there could have been someone, you know, next door that could have had a, a load that may have gone in that container. So, you know, having that type of visibility into where any of these are at any given time, you know, helps it kind of keep pace with what's happening in the truckload industry with load matching, um, you know, and, and re reducing deadhead miles and wasted miles and, carbon emissions and things like that. Great. And Lydia, Bobby, back to you. Um, a two-part question here. Does Next have their own truckers or use owner operators? And secondly, how does Next work with freight forwarders and brokers? Great question. So we, uh, we do a combination of both. Today we are uh, trucker-centric and so we do have IOOs and we're recruiting and onboarding and enabling them every single day and teaching them um, how they can earn a better living uh, and, and actually packaging up things for them to allow them to consume it easily. And in an effort for us to ensure that we have service levels that freight forwarders and BCOs and everyone can, can live with, we do have a fleet. And that fleet is mainly, as I stated earlier, for the truckers that wanna keep earning a living and can't afford to upgrade their cabs just yet, but yet still wanna carry for us. And they can pull from our yard. Um, it also allows us to do some of the things that um, us technology people love, which is I have a sandbox in one of the arguably most inefficient looking for help ports in the world with a fleet of trucks that I can run the tests that other people just aren't afforded to run because of how they have to operate their business. And so when you think of a company like Nest Next coming to, to this industry and actually proving these models out on our own dime versus hoping that we don't break the backs of the American economy to do so, we feel that um, it's something we have to do for the industry, just like our data driving of, uh, of the openness and sharing. So that's the first. And the second is we work with freight forwarders all day long. And, and I know that everyone on this phone knows what they do. They remove the pain from the people who don't want to deal with it. And we've seen that in technology with outsourcing and ultimately led to cloud computing. And so um, just yesterday, we spent the entire afternoon with one of the largest in the world talking about how we're going to grow the business together and solving the problem specifically for Drage. And it was funny that you said that specifically matching the matchbacks for export so that those cans don't need to have GPSs because they're not lost in the wild. They're actually being accounted for because the data will tell me where the can went, where it was left and why it wasn't returned. Mm, great. The next question. It says Canada has instituted a freight fluidity concept to track movements within its freight network across roads, rails, ports, et cetera. Have you worked with or know of any public agencies like ports, MPOs, or DOTs to implement a similar concept and performance measures on the U.S. side? Not yet, but it's interesting. I always love learning from Canada. When you have a country the size of a state, it's interesting the things that you can actually do and you have the space to control and see and do it. So um, our friends up north have some of the luxuries that we don't have in America just by sheer volume and, and actually what's being used. 
But uh, it's a great question, and I would love to follow up on our end because I don't have a specific answer, but you could look for us in a week to get something posted uh, either with you on – actually, it's probably the best place. Why don't we work on posting it on your site because I bet you have a Q&A follow-up for all your webinars. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And next question, as a long hauler, it's very difficult to stay up to date with every terminal's requirements. Is there a tool that would help a driver know requirements as terminal websites don't provide any information? So requirements is a big word. And if we unpackage that, I'd probably like to understand what it is because our goal here is when we onboard you, we go through a significant process that probably can get done in less than an hour. So I don't, but it's pretty comprehensive. And that'll make sure that you're capable of coming in and out of the port and then you've got everything taken care of from your TWIC card to your RFID to your emodal and that you use our SCAT code and it goes on and on. And uh, maybe in the future, we do a specific OO fleet carrier webinar with you so that we can better address how folks can have an easy on-ramp to success with Next. Great. And a question about chassis. What have you implemented to increase the availability of chassis and reduce the time to obtain a chassis at the port? Have these efforts had a big impact on turn time? Well, the good news is we're getting some great questions today, and I refer to it as the chassis catastrophe because I've never seen anything like it. It's uh, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like uh, rickshaws in a third world country are run better than the chassis are in the port here. And it's just a fact of life that, 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 that chose to actually put them on there. And so we at Next have invested and we've got um, probably just under a thousand chassis. And we're partnering with smart chassis companies that have digital tracking systems on them. Most of you have seen them out on the road because we're trying to figure out what is the best chassis. But when you start unpackaging, it's because the BCO cut a deal to get their freight moved and the chassis deal has a deal with a steamship line that gives you two or three days depending on the day of the week and the time of the year and the temperature that's actually happening that day. And so it's really this convoluted iceberg pricing way that nobody wants to do it. And so the chassis moves are a way to sort of create more spaghetti confusion. It, uh, I, I don't have a straightforward answer except we are working with the chassis and the port folks to make sure that we can help them advance it in a way that makes it more fluid than most other industries in the world. And if there's a group or a webinar or a panel, I would love to participate or, uh, or figure out how we meet those folks to help them use technology to know where their chassis are and are they in good shape and can they go on the road? And we would, we want our families next to a truck with one of those chassis from the port next to it. Great. It says, this question is for Lydia. Bobby mentioned the automation of ports, and I was curious if you could speak to the role or opportunity of autonomous trucks in the drayage market, especially as autonomous ports become more prevalent globally. How would Next interact with these technologies in the future? Well, we're a technology company, so we do love technologies. Uh, we actually initiated a conversation with all, all our autonomous truck manufacturers in the past and understand their pace, understand where they are, it seems like uh, the technology probably still requires a little bit more time to mature. We're looking at probably five years, and the biggest hurdle is probably government and regulations. Uh, right now, autonomous trucks can only be operated in Arizona and Florida, I believe, and uh, not necessarily in the ports. Um, ports are relatively more complicated because it's more local trans. trans uh, transactions versus the long haul, it's really go on the freeway. Like if you, I don't know any of our audience that has a Tesla, like you can really drive a Tesla on freeway right now. And you can really drive with confidence while you put an autopilot. But the local traffic and the local uh, conditions are very, very different, especially when it comes to terminals. And also every terminal is different. So that adds more complexity. So we believe probably in the five years, autonomous trucks will be operated mostly for long haul. And uh, that's also the result of the conversations I had with most of the autonomous truck companies. And the next award is, in, 
is definitely interested in working with them. Even though we're trucker centric marketplace, we wanted to empower truck drivers. But we believe that tons of trucks are here to really alleviate the burdens of uh, a long haul truck drivers driving because uh, they can drive, or drive more hours. They can really take a break when they're driving on the freeway. But we believe it will take a little bit more time for autonomous trucks to come into the terminals, considering the technology limitations at this point. And uh, of course, uh, our truck drivers' average age is over 50 right now. So we will lose truck drivers in 10 years. So we believe with the implementation and the maturity of autonomous trucks, we will get more capacity from the industry. While those autonomous trucks and technology can really empower our drivers to be more efficient, make more money. And of course, the priority when I talk to those manufacturers, I would say, you guys need to make the truck cheap and affordable enough for our drivers to afford because they are the true entrepreneurs and they kept our country moving and they really support economies. We wanted to produce and make technologies to really empower them and give them a better life. Great. Thank you, Lydia. And next question, apart from various ratios available, such as cast freight ratio, DAT ratio, are there other parameters in your opinion that can be used to optimize transportation services going forward? So we, uh, I have a couple of theories that we're testing right now in terms of the optimization of it. And it starts by having the data to see where the cans are so you can understand where the inefficiencies lie so you can squeeze it. But, but, but I think more equally as important as, uh, as you look on that theme is when you embrace technology for the good, you figure out how it actually straddles across most areas. And not only we get safety with better efficiencies, but better outcomes for all involved. All right, Henry, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that's one really, you know, what we've been working on and, and what I think Sonar, you know, really does, um, you know, well is enables you to look at things like CAS and DAT and overlay that, uh, overlay other, you know, key indicators that we've identified, whether it's, you know, truck wait times, uh, whether it's ocean freight, you know, China to North America for a 40 foot container, uh, things like that and enable you to see, you know, what correlates, what, what, what can, you know, help me better identify you know, leading indicators of whether it be, you know, rates going up in a specific mode or, you know, an overall, you know, global economic downturn, you know, things like that. I think, you know, having the ability to benchmark your data, what we're working on currently is, is helping, you know, our customers better, you know, use, utilize our API and their system so that they can use it in their own internal uh, language that they understand, or, you know, we can, we can help them digest it in ours and we can display it in our own system so they can interpret it. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's definitely important to, to be looking at how the, all these things correlate and how all these modes, whether it's intermodal, ocean freight, truckload, LTL, how they all work together and how they affect one another. Great. Thank you, Henry. But yes. When, to add on to that, which is why we believe ultimately a marketplace will rule and it will be a supply and demand. And the easiest way to look at that is around liquidity. And if any of us have ever been to ranging from a, a flea market to a store where you can barter and bargain, you can get what you want based on what you're willing to pay and what the others is willing to sell it for. And that truly will be at scale in a marketplace where, where you use the next platform. And we can do two things. My goal is peak 365, which that every day we have steady state freight and we keep the economy and the, and the world moving. But to get there, the data sharing and the flowing so we don't have last year's tariff glut slamming stuff into warehouses that over bulge it and make it uh, and it overly inefficient on the back end. And so what will be interesting is if I can break it down into each mode and what it will take to get that moved, market dynamics will dictate uh, higher or lower prices based upon the availability to deliver, right? Just like you get surge pricing when you go to get into a vehicle when you get out of the airport because it's that late at night and they don't want to take you just five miles away. Sure, absolutely. And then they cancel on you three times and it's now midnight and you're at LAX wondering you should have just walked home. <laughs> absolutely. Next question related to blockchain. Um, it says, does blockchain dovetail with the strategies you're adv advocating and what is the realistic impact of that technology as it relates to drayage? 
Well, we're not blockchain experts. There's plenty of those around the world. And I would probably defer for that question to be answered by one of them, which aren't uh, in this room. Blockchain is just a ledger that allows people to track things that were going on. And so I would probably kick it over to FreightWave's perspective how blockchain would do it because we're, we're, we're really not doing anything with it today. Yeah, we have the Blockchain and Transport Alliance. You know, it, it's really, you know, bringing together, you know, nearly all of the, the players in the transportation industry to, to create a set of standardized, you know, processes and, and how's, you know, blockchain ultimately going to be rolled out. Because I think, I'll go back to the IBM and Maersk, um, you know, question in terms of, you know, what they're working on thinks important for the industry in terms of, like Bobby mentioned, you know, efficiency and tracking and, you know, making sure that we can exchange data and, and you know, proprietary data in a way that, you know, we can both understand, but, but it's not disclosing anything that we would rather, you know, keep private. Um, but, but we can't go off and do this on our own. We have to make sure that it's, it's an industry wide. Um, and I think this is, goes back to the problems we have in Drayage. You know, each of these individual stakeholders, like if IBM and Maersk create something that no one else, you know, really agreed upon and they hold everyone else to it, uh, everyone's, you know, going to be, they're not going to be too happy about that. So, you know, what we're trying to do is create those standardized processes. Like, how, how is this really going to operate? Because that's the real question. Blockchain's a, a nice, cool word, you know, that people like to throw around a lot. But I think at the end of the day, blockchain, it comes down to how we standardized, uh, you know, really what it looks like, how it operates in, you know, in your system and everyone else's. And can it communicate fluidly in a way that, that helps everything, you know, do what it's supposed to do and that's become more efficient. Just wanted to add on what Harry just said. You know, we believe like blockchain, it, it is a buzzword right now and everybody wanted to get a piece of it. Everybody's really looking into that technology, but they, according to, if you, we just heard Bobby's presentation, like what trucking industry is the dinosaur industry. We, we, we haven't even shared the data yet. So I think what we need to do right now is really to encourage all the players in the ecosystem to really lay out the data. Let's make it more transparent so we can really adopt new technologies. But before we can fly, let's crawl, crawl and walk. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point. Excellent point. <laughs> Extremely interesting, and if you uh, were to draw the parallels of the names you mentioned in blockchain and you then look at the themes over the last two or three decades of driving them, and that's how open source really became synonymous. IBM got behind it and made it okay, which is interesting because IBM made all their money from selling the software that was not open source. So they actually ride the trends that dictate how the rest of the world, and then they make it a reality. So what you're seeing with Maersk and IBM, I believe is the beginning of what will happen. Whether or not it has blockchain will be yet to be determined. Yeah, great. All right, next question, short and sweet. Is next a Dre carrier? We're, we're Drayage Marketplace. Um, so we connect the shippers with IOOs and we empower IOOs. We organize and plan trips for them. We allow them to go home when they wanted to. Our goal is really to empower the driver to work the way they want at the time they want. Um, I think we also, on that side, we do own the fleet, as Bobby just mentioned, and that is really to empower our relay program, um, if that answers the question. A simple way of looking at it is our view is your load your way. Great. All right. And the last one here. What steps is Next as an organization taking to cultivate a culture where talent from an old school industry blends and thrives alongside Silicon Valley type talent? Good deal. Well, being from Pennsylvania, landing in Silicon Valley by semi of a choice and have being the son of a trucker uh, who spent many nights waiting for his dad to call him on the CB to tell him he was on his way home, I can tell you that it's my personal passion to ensure that, uh, that we blend and blur the two and, and we really help them come over. And if you were to come to our office, you'd see that we have uh, children of truck drivers that are just like myself that are here. But we do have webinars, we have training, we have enablement, and we do believe in, I, look, I just came from a construction industry, which you would argue is just like this industry or energy and electricity is just like this industry. And as you see internet technology spill over, it's a personal passion to ensure that we can intersect the two that has a meaningful outcome. 
And, and you'll see that really, I think, in the values that we have as a company here with Next around our true North Star in helping these two industries merge and, and not leaving anyone behind. And also to add on that, you know, everyone in an industry knows drainage is painful, right? But we've been living in the pain and we got numb about it for the past centuries. So all of a sudden, next became the first pioneer and raised their hand and say, I, I wanted to solve this problem. I wanted to make it painless. I wanted the best of people who truly believe in what we're doing. That's how we attract the best talents, not only from Silicon Valley, but also from the industry. We down the knowledge from our industry focus. We make it better. We create a new solution. That's why the industry calls our new norm. And uh, now we are really become the shining beacon of the Jewish industry. And we wanted to continue to become that. And the driving towards our common goal is really to make Jewish painless. Great. We did have one more slip in here, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it. We had a little bit of the talk around the dinosaurs. It says yellow taxis were a dinosaur that got disrupted by Uber and Lyft in an instant. Do you feel that type of disruption exists in this space? That's a great question. And here I thought the real question, which would be the last one, and I'll answer that before we go on, is yes, we are hiring. And you can take a look <laughs> at our website because we need people from both sides of the industry to come and join us and make that happen. Um, if you were to look at the statistics of how transportation and congestion has been alleviated in cities, and let's just pick one called San Francisco, the taxi cab business stayed steady and actually increased. And the amount of people that didn't have vehicles on the road and the infrastructure for the city to not have to put more buses or dig tunnels to put transportation was alleviated by this uh, pressure relief valve called uh, gig economy movement of people through, uh, through services. And so in end, if you think about it, the end consumer, me, you, and most of us on the phone, actually had a better quality of life because we got to go where we wanted to, when we wanted to on demand. And we do, believe, we do know we live in an on-demand world and an economy just based upon uh, probably most of the phones we're carrying in our pockets today. So we think it'll be a net increase, not a uh, disruption in a negative way. Okay, great. All right. Well, everyone, that looks like all that we have for today. So thanks to those of you in the audience for being with us today for your engaging questions. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you to Next Trucking for partnering with us. And thank you again to Lydia, Bobby, and Henry for sharing your insights. We hope you'll join us again for another webinar soon. Have a great day. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.